The next item of business is debate on motion 17281 in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton on the treatment time guarantee. Can I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons? And I call on Alex Cole Hamilton to speak to and move the motion for up to eight minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I move the motion in my name. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the Cabinet Secretary for the time that she has given to meet with me personally on this exact subject matter. I know that she agrees with me on much of uh, the problems that I, we identify in this motion. Uh, we cannot support her amendment tonight because I do think it um, deletes much of the reference to the problem. Um, but I do welcome the tone and, in fact, the existence of the apology that is contained within that. Uh, Presiding officer, there is a law that this Parliament passed which this government has proceeded to break over 190,000 times since it received royal assent. All told, the legal bonds of the legally binding treatment time guarantee are routinely broken upwards of 200 times every single day. To put that in a local context, in NHS Lothian, there are 34,000 people who've had to wait over 12 weeks this year. Greater Glasgow and Clyde, that's 32,000. And in NHS, Grampian, 26 or 27,000. There is no sanction for this. No ministers ever resign and nobody gets a fine. It's a legally binding guarantee in name only. But the human cost of this is measured out in anxiety, frustration, pain and suffering. It put lives on hold. It puts potentially life-saving treatment just out of reach and it visits with each of us in our constituency surgeries every single week. Every single one of those patients has been let down by the false hope offered by this government and each tells a very similar story. A letter arrives shortly after diagnosis advising them of their legal guarantee to have treatment begin within 12 weeks. For most people that sounds manageable. 12 weeks is a season. You could get your diagnosis in early spring and then they'll see you before your holidays in July. It might mean a bit longer on the pain medication than you'd hoped, but you can tough it out. Accordingly, you plan for your recovery. Everyone would. You plan for the time after your convalescence, where hopefully free of pain and disease, you can start to live your life again. You accept wedding invitations. You agree to host Christmas for the family. You book a holiday for six months from now because according to your letter, you'll be well out of the woods by then. After about nine weeks, though, you begin to wonder why they haven't booked you in yet. A gnawing sense of doubt begins to creep over you. So, on perhaps the Monday of week 10, you phone the surgical ward to ask about your surgery. That's when you get the bombshell. You aren't going to be seen in two weeks' time after all. In fact, more to the point, you aren't likely to be seen for at least another 40 weeks in some cases. That must just be devastating to hear. You ask about your holiday. They say, don't leave the country. You ask about the wedding you're planning to, to go to, and you're told it might, you wouldn't risk it because you might get a cancellation. You ask about Christmas. They say it's doubtful because hopefully with any luck, you'll just be out of surgery by then. Aside from all the havoc that this causes you in terms of basic life administration, add to that the pain or immobility that you might be in. There might be anxiety, too, about the condition getting worse or even becoming life-threatening. Presiding officer, there are many, many real-life examples I could offer from West Edinburgh, and I'm sure every member in this chamber could speak to a case in their own constituency, but I want to single one person out. In December, I was contacted by Jane Ross. Jane has suffered several failures of the treatment time guarantee relating to urology at the Western General Hospital in Edinburgh over the past three years. After developing bladder issues, she waited six months for a consultant appointment and then was referred for a test which took more than a year to be performed. The bladder by this time was so inflamed that it had shrunk to a fifth of its normal size. The pain was so severe that she had to control it by not drinking at all until around 4 p.m. in the afternoon, which allowed her to struggle through her part-time job. Dehydration started to affect her kidneys and gave her heart palpitations. It caused issues with her diabetes. In August last year, after the test results came back, she and her consultant agreed that she would need to have her bladder removed and a urostomy performed. And like most people, she received a notification around her rights under the treatment time guarantee. And so she waited 
in a worsening state of physical health and suffering. Presiding officer, all told, it took 36 weeks for her to have that operation. That wait was bad enough, but she had to lurch from week to agonizing week, existing in this excruciating state under the misapprehension that treatment was just around the corner. I wanted to weep for her. It is one of the hardest cases I have dealt with. Presiding officer, this government, to its credit, has put great store in the concept of realistic medicine. I'm a fellow traveler here, absolutely. That basic precept that we should give patients all of the facts and options about their condition and then credit them with the maturity and mental capacity to direct their care. But that shouldn't just be about end of life issues, that should be about every aspect of our journey through our National Health Service. People aren't stupid, presiding officer. They know that our NHS is oversubscribed, that in all likelihood they would have to wait, they may have to wait a protracted period of time for treatment. That's not really the thing that bothers them. They accept those waits, they understand it. It's why part and parcel of why our NHS is still deservedly the most well-regarded institution in our country. They just want people to be straight with them. They want doctors to be straight with them and they want politicians to be straight with them. To have someone from the outset tell you it's going to be 40 or 50 weeks, you can plan accordingly around that. Some people may well decide to go private faced with that reality. That in turn might relieve pressure on other waiting lists, allowing people a shorter time uh, before they are treated by freeing up capacity and reducing those weights still further. Whatever your worldview, presiding officer, in this chamber, I would hope that we would all agree that we just can't go on like this, giving people that element of false ho hope. Now, I understand aiming to stop breaking its own guarantee by 2021 may be an unavoidable reality for this government, given workforce issues and capacity strain, our aging population and the various issues that we are facing and the fires that we are fighting. I accept that, but all I ask is that this government stop sending out letters giving people false hope. Explain to them why their treatment has been set back and apologize to them for the discomfort that this causes. People are mature, they understand our NHS is under pressure, but they still value it immensely. They give thanks every single day for those hardworking staff toiling for hours and hours, days upon end, to make them well and to get through those waiting lists. We just need to be straight with people because they deserve to know where they stand. So I move the motion in my name and I ask the Chamber to support it tonight. Thank you. Uh, before I call the Minister, can I say it's disappointing when people are not in at the beginning of a debate to which they wish to contribute, and uh, I would expect a note uh, from those that were in this position. I now call on Jean Freeman to speak to and move Amendment 17281.4. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, up to six minutes, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Pre Presiding Officer. I <clears throat> want to start by welcoming the debate on what is an important issue for patients across Scotland. There can surely be no doubt that I have been very clear from the outset that long waits are unacceptable and improving performance against waiting times is a key priority for me, one of three. So let me take this opportunity to again offer my unreserved apology to everyone who is currently experiencing or has experienced a delay anywhere in the health system. As I've said before, too many people are waiting too long for outpatient appointments and treatment. I know only too well the impact that has not only on the patient, uh, on their physical and mental health, but also on their families. But I also know that knowing that isn't enough. People quite rightly expect us to do something to change that. And my determination to do just that is exactly why I published the Waiting Times Improvement Plan in October last year to substantially and sustainably improve waiting times, particularly for those waiting the longest and backed by significant additional financial investment. But while we increase capacity in the NHS to deliver on that plan, for those people that do have to wait longer than 12 weeks, health boards need to ensure that each and every person is given a realistic timeline from the very beginning of their journey and is kept up to date with any changes that affect that timeline. And around a year ago, my predecessor, Shona Robinson, said that health boards should be advising patients of their likely wait and the reasons for delay. 
and we committed to reinforcing that through the revision of the Charter of Patients' Rights and Responsibilities, which is routinely reviewed every five years, with the latest review beginning in 2017. That revision of the Charter has gone through a rigorous engagement process, including with stakeholders such as the Patient Advice and Support Service, and I'm pleased today to advise members that the revised Charter will be laid in Parliament before recess and applicable from autumn this year. We have also been working with our health boards and key stakeholders across the country to deliver on that commitment of giving clarity to patients on the length of time they can expect before treatment and the revised letter and guidance will be issued, will be used nationally and will be issued to boards by the end of this week. Presiding officer, since the introduction of the waiting times guarantee, around nine out of 10 patients have been seen and treated within 12 weeks. That's over 1.7 million patients. And every bit of that achievement is down to the staff working in the health service. Recognizing that matters, but it does not and it will not deflect from my determination to see improvement. Our work to improve performance is not confined to the treatment time guarantee, but extends to mental health, our cancer targets, and those attending A&E departments. Our a &E performance is the best anywhere in the UK and has been for more than four years. That is despite a significant and sustained increase in a &E attendances. But there is more to do, continuing our work with the Royal College of Emergency Medicine in Scotland, consistently implementing the six essential actions across Scotland with no variation and improving hospital flow and discharge. Since October, we have invested 26.7 million from the 850 million total to make immediate reductions in waiting times across a range of procedures and importantly focus board by board on the most pressing areas of longest wait. That varies board by board and it's important the resources are targeted in that way. Last month I announced a further 70 million for this year. This will, will see additional recruitment of specialists and healthcare professionals increased numbers of orthopaedic and cataract procedures and an increase in the number of outpatient appointments and diagnostic procedures. All of it aimed at meeting the first waiting times milestone this autumn. But whilst increasing activity is important, we need to build resilience into the system so that we have future sustainability. That comes by increasing capacity through the network of elective and diagnostic centres we are creating and the work of the Scottish Access Collaborative, which brings together clinicians, healthcare professionals and others to ensure that the design of our patient care and our pathways are as streamlined and effective as they can be. NHS Scotland is recognised as a world leader in quality improvement. It is the central underpinning of our patient safety programme. So that must be embedded in the delivery of all our improvement programmes, including the Waiting Times Improvement Plan. So alongside all I've outlined and much more beside, runs our Access QI work to increase our capacity to consistently improve patient pathways and patient experience and existing across all improvement programmes. Presiding Officer, I accept and have said before here in this chamber and elsewhere that our performance on waiting times must improve and that for every single person who is waiting longer than they should, that is a time for them that is anxious, that will involve pain and distress and is unacceptable. But just saying it isn't enough. That's why I'm disappointed that what we need to have and what we're not seeing are specific plans to improve our waiting times improvement plan. Our performance on waiting times must improve and I believe our commitment to that is clearly evidenced by the many actions we and staff across the NHS are taking. All of it, the immediate activity, the long-term sustainable solutions, all of it is focused on delivering the care patients need within the time frame they rightly inspect, expect and in reaching a better balance between demand and capacity so that we are better placed with sustainable solutions now and for the future. And with that, I move the amendment in my name.
I now call on Miles Briggs to speak to and move Amendment 17281.1 for up to five minutes. Please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to start by thanking the Liberal Democrats for using their business uh, to bring forward this important debate. No one can be in any doubt that since Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP government introduced the patient treatment time guarantee in 2011, patients and their families have been let down. I also believe, though, it's important to look at the wider patient treatment targets which the Scottish Government is failing to meet and which I've outlined also in my amendment. Deputy Presiding Officer, this week is Mental Health Awareness Week. Now, I welcome the positive campaigns to raise awareness and actively for us all to work to tackle stigma which still exists around mental health. But the question which I'm asked again and again is what's the point at trying to encourage people to come forward when they're often going to be failed when they seek help? Alex Cole Hamilton and Alison Johnson and I represent uh, Lothian and they will I'm sure uh, also be acutely aware of cases where unacceptable psychological waiting times and the CAMS waiting times targets have failed our own constituents. And I'm sure I'm not the only MSP who've had parents um, at my advice surgeries desperately trying to navigate the CAM system, telling me how they've been told that for children and young people the waiting time here in Lothian is over a year and for adults two years. Now I have to say that parents and families I represent in Lothian are way beyond wanting apologies now from SNP ministers. They want action. After 12 years in office, they feel abandoned by the government and the situation in Lothian is getting worse and worse. Mental health waiting times here in the capital are now beyond crisis level and the situation is showing no sign of improvement. Now I have parents in Lothian who've been told by GPs to go private to access support for their children and NHS Lothian do not clearly have the capacity. Children who are in desperate need of support being told to wait over a year, in some cases, as the Health and Sport Committee heard uh, re recently from parents, parents being told that if a child was self-harming, they would likely to be seen earlier. This is Scotland's young people, our future, and they are being failed. Deputy Presiding Officer, as co-chair of the Parliament's cross-party group on cancer, I also hear regularly about the mental health impact on suspected cancers and what that brings to individuals. Weeks and months of waiting and not knowing with sleepless nights and unimaginable stress. The latest cancer waiting times show only 82.9% of patients in Scotland with an urgent referral for a suspicion of cancer starting treatment within 62 days. As Cancer Research UK stated, these figures show a service under huge strain with too many patients waiting too long. Now, um, very briefly. Yeah. Will the member Jean accept Jean that the 31-day tar target is being met? And will the member also explain to me how, in his amendment calling for additional resources for the NHS, we will be able to do that, given the uh, Tory party's plans on tax cuts and the refusal to back a budget that included £850 million for waiting times and £250 additional for mental health? Well, this is what I want to. This is what I hope this debate would rise uh, beyond. The government has been given two billion pounds in additional health resources, which is a fact. But today's debate should be a wake-up call for the cabinet secretary, not for her to just to try to score cheap points, because she should know just how desperate the system is under her watch. Now, almost since the day the government passed the, trans the treatment time guarantee, we've heard excuse and excuse from SNP ministers, and that has to end. Patients want and should be, be receiving timely treatment and our NHS professionals want and should be able to provide the person-centred care that we all want to see, not constantly juggling patients in a desperate attempt to meet SNP targets. Now the Cabinet Secretary has mentioned and made much of the £850 million waiting time improvement plan which was published in 2018. Now, early information on that improvement plan is being sp uh, spent on points towards NHS boards accessing funds for new pieces of medical equipment and investigatory equipment. But on the ground across health boards, there's not the staffing in place to utilize these pieces of equipment, the full capacity uh, which they can provide, and additional clinics aren't being taken up. So where we will actually see that improvement isn't being realized. Perhaps the only area where ministers have achieved some progress is the increased use of private capacity in Scotland. Now, the plan sets out actions to ensure future delivery of waiting time standards and guarantees for patients across Scotland by the spring of 2021. However, SNP ministers have already publicly accepted that it's failed to deliver on these promises made to patients across Scotland. And, wait, and the waiting time improvement plan will actually reduce the number of inpatient day cases seen from 90% target to 75% target. 
um, by October of 2019. It would seem that SNP ministers' answers to not being able to meet the target is to water it down even further. Now, Deputy Presiding Officer, to conclude, I believe we actually need a national debate about the wider impact of targets on our health service. I meet with NHS professionals every week who feel that the target culture which is built up in our NHS is focusing resources on the wrong priorities, all at the same time as demoralising our NHS professionals who are often unable to meet these very targets. SNP waiting times promises made to patients across Scotland have been broken. And that's the minister's asking which ones. She's read out all the targets she's broken. And patients Could feel let down by this government. And it would be good if ministers actually listen to that fact. Alice Cole Ham Hamilton uh, often brings please. quotes to this chamber. As I, I, Albert Einstein said, if you, want to do if you want different results, you have to do a different approach. I move amendment in my name. Thank you. Now I call Monica Lennon to speak to you and move amendment 17281.2. Up to five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to Alex Cole Hamilton for securing this important debate, but also for a really excellent speech. And I uh, thank him for telling us about his constituent, Jane Ross. The treatment time guarantee is a law. It should have ensured people receive treatment within 12 weeks. But the most recent figures tell us that the Scottish Government has broken its own law around 190,000 times since it was introduced in 2012 by Nicola Sturgeon when she was the first, or when she was the health secretary. That's Nicola Sturgeon who is now Scotland's first minister and who recently said that she's not surprised about long waiting times. The current health secretary, Jean Freeman, has admitted that waiting times are too long and I agree, I think we all agree, this is a broken promise too far. But is the cabinet secretary's best response really to continue breaking the law until at least 2021? This law, presiding officer, is not worth the paper it is written on. If it were any other law in Scotland, and if it were anyone else other than the Scottish Government breaking it, there would be consequences. But as things stand, there is no penalty if I have time. If you take an intervention, you don't get your time back. So I leave to the member to decide. I'll take the intervention, yep. Minister. I thank Monica Lennon for taking the intervention. Just to, uh, to clarify about the Patient Rights Scotland Act 2011, which was decided by and voted on by this parliament, that it was not legally enforceable by legal action. Does she disagree with the parliament's decision on that? Monica Lennon. Well, we'll get to the points about what the law actually says, but the, the main point here, I would say to the chamber, is the fact that we've just heard that 190,000 patients have been let down, and that is a disgrace. In a Scottish Labour business debate um, in May last year, and I wish I had more time for interventions, but we don't, President Officer. In a Scottish Labour business debate in May of last year, we forced the Scottish Government into a commitment to amend the Charter of Patient Rights and Responsibilities to ensure patients get an accurate waiting time estimate. A year later, and we drafted our amendment, no changes had been made to the Charter. And it's been our concern that health boards have not been communicating well enough with patients. So we hear what the, the Cabinet Secretary said today by way of update. But the Parliament and the country have been waiting long enough already. Um, so I hope she can convince us that we can believe her this time that action uh, and real change will, will happen. Because these changes can't happen at a snail's pace. That is why Scottish Labour's amendment highlights our disappointment at the lack of progress in a year. I'm sure we're all thinking about constituents today who have been let down. Behind the figures are people in pain or distress waiting far too long for treatment. And as Miles Briggs has said, this is Mental Health Awareness Week. So it's timely to acknowledge the emotional upset and nervous anxiety people can experience while waiting for treatment. Long and indefinite waits can have far-reaching consequences for people touching all areas of their lives. It's easy to see how people can be quickly plunged into financial difficulty or poverty because of ill health and long waiting times can have terrible consequences for people who are low paid, self-employed and those in insecure employment. So the implications of illness and pain extend beyond the individual and impact families, communities and workplaces. The workforce crisis in the NHS has many consequences and too often it's the most vulnerable people who pay the price. Long waiting times is a recurring issue for my constituents. Last year, um, one woman in Hamilton waited over 80 weeks for surgery on her wrist and she's now worried about permanent long-term damage. 
My family has benefited hugely from the NHS in the last few years and I will be forever grateful. My mum's GP probably saved her life and she has been successfully treated for, for cancer and this month will be celebrating her 60th birthday and, and thank goodness for that. But after her cancer treatment, she had to get a further operation and she had to wait longer than 12 weeks. My mum had to wait 42 weeks and this sets her progress back. My mum's not looking for an apology. She doesn't want other people to have to wait this long in future. In conclusion, presiding officer, Scottish Labour strongly supports the Liberal Democrat motion, which rightly holds the government to account over its failure to comply with its own law. We support the Conservative amendment, highlighting the other important NHS targets that have been missed. And we welcome Jane Freeman's apology to patients in her amendment and her agreement that patients should have expected waiting times in writing. But we can't support this amendment because it doesn't acknowledge the extent to which the government has broken its own law, the plan to continue breaching it until 2021, or acknowledge that there is no redress. We call on the government to honour its commitments and honour the people of Scotland. Thank you. Please move your amendment. I move the amendment in my Thank name. Thank you. I'm sorry, it is, everybody is tight on time. That's what happens with these short debates and that's what the Bureau has agreed. So you just have to live with it. Uh, Alison Johnson, four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I too extend my thanks to our NHS staff who work tirelessly to improve our health too frequently in an extremely pressurised environment. I welcome the fact that we're debating the treatment time guarantee this afternoon. My own Green Amendment wasn't selected, and in this instance it is particularly frustrating, as neither the motion or the amendment outline the problem and the potential solution in a way that the Greens feel is of greatest benefit to patients. Alex Cole Hamilton is right to describe the severity of the problem, but I do not agree that a letter to patients, which has the potential to make them feel like another statistic, is an adequate response. I appreciate the proposed actions set out in the Cabinet Secretary's amendments, but regret that the context of Alex Cole Hamilton's motion has been deleted entirely. I agree with the contents of Monica Lennon's amendments, and while I agree too with the amendment in Miles Briggs' name, I can't square his party's commitment to a great tax cut for the wealthiest with increased funding for the NHS. Yeah, yeah. Shorter waiting times can reduce patient anxiety, improve patients' quality of life, improve clinical outcomes. We're all in agreement that the sooner a patient can access treatment, the better. That's why waiting times are important. But as we know, there are considerable workforce pressures across NHS Scotland, which is treating patients with increasingly complex conditions and multi-morbidities. And of course, Brexit will not help. The BMA has repeatedly raised concerns about the impact of Brexit on the health workforce. And I'm concerned that if we can't recruit sufficient numbers, the onus to improve waiting times will fall, will be placed on the existing workforce. The Scottish Government's waiting times improvement plan states that it will encourage more capacity by working with staff side and employers to reduce sickness absent rates with a focus on staff health and well-being. But given that a recent BMA survey showed that 91% 90 of doctors surveyed who, who, who responded are already working over their allotted hours, I would argue that many NHS workers are already over capacity. Those working in the NHS must be able to take a day off due to their own, Ill, their own ill health when they need one. And of course, it is hugely upsetting and disappointing for patients when the treatment time guarantee isn't adhered to. But we also have to make sure that we avoid making staff feel like they've failed when they're working incredibly hard. Opposition parties are right to criticise the government, but it can't be beyond all of us to find a constructive way forward with constructive steps that can be taken to bolster our struggling health service. The Scottish Government needs to be honest about what level of service the NHS in Scotland can re realistically provide in light of workforce pressures and current funding. Audit Scotland say in their 2018 report that the NHS in Scotland is not in a financially sustainable position. NHS boards are struggling to break even, relying increasingly on Scottish Government loans and one-off savings. It recommends that the government, NHS boards, integration authorities work together to develop a clearer understanding of demand, capacity, 
within primary and secondary care and publish clear and easy to understand information, including how much funding was provided, what it was spent on and what impact that had. I would urge the Cabinet Secretary to take this on board and hold a national conversation on the NHS, a far broader one than Miles Briggs outlined. You know, what do we all expect from the NHS? How much are we all willing to pay to meet those expectations? Because missed targets are a symptom of wider issues and placing more pressure on boards and staff to meet those targets won't solve the problem. Let's ensure health boards have the resources they require. Let's ensure there's a greater focus on preventative health agenda to lessen that strain. That'll help enable us to meet the treatment time guarantee. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you very much. Open debate, type four minutes. Mike Rumbles, followed by Emma Harper. Mr Rumbles, please. Presiding officer, in anticipation of this debate, I looked up the definition of the word guarantee in the dictionary. It says it's a formal assurance, typically in writing, that certain conditions will be fulfilled. Another definition is that a guarantee is a legal term more comprehensive and of higher import than either a warranty or security. So what actually is it? It seems to me to be nothing more than an unfulfilled promise to the 27,000 patients in NHS Grampian who've had to wait longer than the 12 weeks for their treatment since this guarantee took effect. In the last quarter of last year alone, it was 42.5% of all patients waiting for treatment in NHS Grampian. Now, I want to be here, uh, clear here. I don't blame the hardworking staff who work for NHS Grampian for this sorry state of affairs. I don't blame the staff for the fact that NHS Grampian has regularly had the worst record for operations cancelled for non-clinical reasons, or that it has the worst record in Scotland for treating child and adolescent mental health problems. Indeed, in other areas too, the record of Grampian Health Board in treating patients is less than spectacular. For the final quarter of last year, the board had the second worst record for treatment within the 31-day standard from decision to treat to first cancer treatment. With chronic pain treatment, 85% of patients referred to a clinic in Grampian had received treatment in the final quarter of last year out with the guaranteed time. Now, I could go on with a rather lengthy list of various treatments and illnesses where patients in NHS Grampian come out worst or almost worst than for any other health board area in the country. Now, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm not going to do that because You've given me just four minutes and I wouldn't have the time to do it. But now we often talk about a postcode lottery for various treatments, but it's worse than that for the 11% of Scotland's population who happen to live in the Grampian Health Board area. Now I said that I didn't blame the hardworking staff for the situation we find ourselves in the Grampian NHS. I want to put the blame for this sorry state of affairs fairly and squarely at the door of the Scottish Government. Why? It's because Scottish ministers have, over the last 10 years, failed to provide £239 million of funding that should have come to Grampian Health Board over this period. These are not my figures. These are the figures provided by the Scottish Government and are available to everyone through the Scottish Parliament's information service. Unfortunately, I haven't got the time. I'd love to. The Scottish Government's own NRAC formula a formula which still underfunds Grampian's population, has never, I say that again, has never been fully funded, unlike other health boards. This cumulative underfunding over the last 10 years has without doubt led to the worsening of patient care in the northeast. Now, it's no good the, 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 the health secretary saying, every time I raise this over the last three years, that more and more money is coming to the NHS or the NRAC formula is closing, well actually the NRAC formula this year is increasing again and it still doesn't cover the money, the £239 million that we've already lost. As far as Grampian NHS is concerned, the Scottish Government should address this funding shortfall to enable the staff at Grampian to receive the resources they need to do their job to meet the treatment time guarantee. The people of the North East demand action to put this right. And they want action now from the Scottish Government. And I'm glad the ministers are here to listen to that. Thank you very much, Mr Rumbles. A wee correction. I didn't give you four minutes. It was the Bureau and the Parliament then voted for the four minutes. I'm merely the policeman. Uh, I call... <laughs> I call... Um, <laughs> 
I call Emma Harper to be followed by Edward Mountain. Thank you, President Officer. Again, we're here in chamber discussing healthcare and our NHS, and as always from the outset, I want to put my thanks on record for our incredibly skilled and competent NHS staff across Scotland, many of whom are my former colleagues. Our NHS in Scotland delivers a wide range of complex specialist care and treatment for the people in Scotland, and services provided in NHS hospitals are extremely diverse and range from complex diagnostic procedures to life-changing and indeed life-saving surgeries, both planned and emergency. There are a wide range of wait and time targets to be measured, surgical, medical, outpatient, inpatient, and mental health. And uh, you know, I'm interested in the Lib Dem motion because I do recognise that there are challenges with, it, with our NHS when it comes to waiting times. But it is under the SNP Scottish Government that the NHS in Scotland is outperforming the rest of the UK. The, Patients right Act, the Patient Rights Act, which the motion refers, was introduced by the Scottish Government in 2011. And its principal aim was to enshrine in law that patients must be supported properly and their voices must be heard. And since October 2012, the Patients' Right Act has set out a 12-week treatment time guarantee for planned inpatient and day cases. The 12-week target applies once the patient has been diagnosed and has agreed the treatment with their clinician. It's worth noting also that there, it is the responsibility of the health boards to ensure that eligible patients receive the treatment within 12 weeks. This may mean that with the patient's consent, the health board, board arranges for a patient to be treated in another health board area. I am interested in addressing the points that Alec Cole Hamilton raised about performing surgery at private clinics to free up time. That's not the answer. Surgical procedures that don't require high dependency unit, and I'm not going to take an intervention because we get four minutes because that's how you chose it. Surgical procedures that do not require high dependency units or intensive care unit beds, such as day case herniography or arthroplasty, can be done privately. But these are procedures which help support staff learning and knowledge in patient care, airway management, observation of vital signs as part of a clinical care pathway. It would take me longer to explain than the four minutes about how continuous professional development, addressing complications, which the NHS are the ones that have to deal with, and the clinical care pathways that require a multidisciplinary team who all work with each other and know each other to support these pathways. So private hospital uh, freeing up time isn't the answer. It may be one answer, but the whole issue is complicated and complex. But I am pleased that the Scottish Government recognise that there have been challenges in meeting all waiting times across Scotland. It is important to ensure no one is waiting too long for appointments and treatment. And I was pleased when the Health Secretary published the £850 million waiting times improvement plan just last October 2018. That's not long ago, presiding officer. I think we need to allow time for health boards and everybody to look at what they're doing to improve waiting times as the Cabinet Secretary introduced the plan last October. Jan Gardner, the Chief Exec of the Golden Jubilee, welcomed the announcement and plan, citing that it provides direct funding for specialists to provide an additional 200 general surgery operations, 600 ophthalmic procedures and 1,200 endoscopies and colonoscopies each year across Scotland an action which will help in, uh, reduce waiting times. Presiding officer, the strategy proposes that some patients, particularly those that are waiting for a routine checkup or test results, would be seen closer to home by a team of community health care professionals with close links to the hospital. The government is committed to addressing the challenges we have heard about this afternoon. And as we have seen, the cabinet secretary is taking a proactive approach. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you very much. Uh, Edward Mountain to be followed by James Kelly. Mr Mountain, please. Thank you, presiding officer. And I'd like to thank the Liberal Democrats for allowing us to debate this subject this afternoon. In my short time, I want to focus on waiting times in NHS Highland. Let's be clear, the government made a 12-week waiting time guarantee and patients expect it. And clinicians want to deliver it, but frankly, they don't have the resources to do so. I do appreciate the Cabinet Secretary has said sorry, but sorry isn't going to be enough. We have seen borne out in the latest figures in the NHS Highland that in the last quarter, for example, 45% of patients waited more than 12 weeks for treatment. And in the same quarter, 20% of patients were not treated within the 18 weeks that they were referred. I don't think NHS Highland is on the same page as the Scottish Government 
on target. Indeed, I venture to say they're in a different book. Pay no, I'll take an intervention for the Cabinet Secretary, but, but, but not from you, I'm afraid. <laughs> Patients feel let down and clinical staff feel the burden of responsibility. They shouldn't. They are not the ones to blame. The truth of this matter is NHS Highland, like many health boards, is understaffed and overstretched. Why? Well, I can tell you. It's because this government, with 12 years of management, has mismanaged the recruitment of our health staff. We don't have enough GPs, we don't have enough nurses, and we don't even have enough radiologists. And indeed, huge pressure is placed on clinicians to deliver treatment time guarantees. Yes, I will take an intervention. I'm always Cabinet delighted Cabinet Secretary. To. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mountain. Um, can I just point out that in the initial uh, additional uh, funding uh, that I talked about, NHS Highland received significant additional funding over uh, £2 million uh, for ophthalmology, general surgery, endoscopy and so on. And that would be additional funding that you voted against when you voted against our budget. So grateful if you could explain to me how you Thank square you. that particular Mr. circle. Mr Mountain. Indeed, and it's always nice to hear the Cabinet Secretary make comments like that so I can respond to them. So when it comes to ophthalmic treatment, how, did that, how was that delivered? Not by NHS staffs, but by co private companies who were brought in because this government hadn't got the staff in place to deliver them. And let me therefore take the Cabinet Secretary back to John Sturrock's report, which we discussed very briefly the other day, which was a report into bullying and harassment in NHS Highland which has a terrible impact, by his own, in his own words, on the staff and their well-being. And I'm going to focus on just one passage, and let me make sure I read it out right. And it says, unrealistic or unachievable expectations can lead to managerial staff to pressurise clinical and other staff to improve performance. Thus, these policies may have an adverse impact on the people charged with delivering them, leading to dysfunction and a loss of morale, which can then cascade down through the system. Now, that's a damning indictment, Cabinet Secretary. And I therefore believe that the way that this has been rolled out in NHS Highland and not delivered is not only bad for our health, but bad for the health of the staff that work there. Solutions are desperately needed. And this government has to improve on the recruitment levels to a point where staff have a realistic chance of achieving waiting times. And I accept that the waiting time improvement plan that the Cabinet Secretary has announced is a step in the right direction. I also welcome the construction of a mobile theatre at Ragmore Hospital for a new and a new elective care centre. It is indeed a good start, but we need more. So, Presiding Officer, let us all be clear, we all cherish our NHS. We owe a huge debt of gratitude to our doctors and nurses, and we need to care more for those that care for us, putting too much pressure on them to deliver waiting times that they're not resourced to deliver is not good enough, Thank and you. it needs to change. Thank you very much. James Kelly, to be followed by George Adams. Mr Adams, the last speaker in the open debate. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I thank Alec Cole Hamilton and the Liberal Democrats for bringing forward this important motion today, uh, because it shines a light on a, a very serious issue in terms of the, the amount of time that patients are having to wait for treatment. I mean, the statistics tell us that the treatment time guarantee has been broken 190,000 times, and there are 25,000 people still on waiting lists. Um, but it's not just the, st the, the statistics and the fact that the situation is not getting any better. It's the human stories uh, behind those statistics. And uh, I, like other MSPs, have been inundated with uh, cases from constituents who uh, have had difficult experiences. There are two in particular I want to highlight in the Rutherglen area. Uh, one gentleman who had a knee issue, um, which it took him eight months to get you know, properly uh, diagnosed uh, and uh, a tre treatment outlined. And he was given a treatment uh, time guarantee of January this year, um, but then told it would be October before there would be uh, any treatment, um, which caused him uh, uh, a, a great deal of uh, stress. Uh, and then there was a, a lady who had a hip issue uh, which was originally x-rayed in July 2018 
Um, it took until the end of the year to diagnose proper treatment, uh, a replacement, and uh, a treatment time guarantee was given of April 2019. Um, but again, the patient was advised it was going to be October 2019 before uh, that would be dealt with, uh, at least at, uh, October 2019. And uh, it's, not, it's not only acceptable the length of time that people are having to wait. You know, the, what these examples show is the failings in the system from the time it takes to diagnose uh, someone's issue to, through to them getting treatment. And the story behind that is that the impact that then, it then has on them, you know, the pain that they're having to suffer, uh, the mental trauma that that causes, the difficulty it is for their, for their family, the disruption on their life, you know, their ability to, to go out and work and participate in normal everyday activities. It's, it's unacceptable. And I have to say, it's, it's a sad comment on the 20th anniversary of the Parliament. There's been a lot of commentary over the last couple of weeks, but that we passed a law in 2011 and it's been broken 190,000 uh, times. But not only that, uh, it's the effect that that's had on individuals uh, and on communities uh, throughout Scotland. Uh, people are entitled to, be, to, to better. I mean, I know the Cabinet Secretary's uh, apologies. Um, uh, however, uh, it's absolutely essential that people get effective notice of when they're going to get treatment, but also, you know, we need to see serious progress in terms of this action plan to rectify the problem by 2021. What I'm seeing on the, the ground is that that's, that's not happening currently. Um, so, you know, to sum up, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, we've all uh, experienced, you know, great advantages and benefits of the NHS. We see it in our, in our own lives and our families' lives. Uh, but what, unfortunately, we're seeing on the ground currently is people having to wait an inordinate amount of time not only for diagnosis, but for treatment, and it's causing real disruption to their lives. People expect better, and we demand better from this government. Thank you very much. I thank members for keeping their time so far. Mr Adam, don't break the habit. I like and then we so move far, to closing presiding speeches. Officer. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. When we keep having these debates, we're all aware of the challenges that the NHS faces in these times. But one of the most disappointing facts of this debate and others coming from the opposition is I never hear any new ideas. I never hear solutions. I never hear any options that they're going to do that are going to make any difference. Well, the Patient Rights Scotland Act created, I've got too much to talk about, Mr. Uh, Cole Hamilton. 2011 created a statutory, well, you could have said it in your time, uh, treatment time guarantee of 12 weeks. Now, since then, over 1.7 million inpatients and day cases have benefited, benefited from the 12-week target since it was introduced. That's 90% since it was introduced, been seen in 12 weeks. 90% presiding officer. While it's short of the targets, it's still a movement in the right direction. And this will obviously be helped, uh, as the Cabinet Secretary has already said, with the recently published £850 million waiting times improvement plan. But let's look at the NHS in Scotland. Our Scottish Government is committed to delivering the investment and reform to ensure that the NHS is fit for the changing needs of the 21st century Scotland. And there have been major improvements in public health under our SNP government and the record high health funding in 2019-2020. Health and sport resource spending will exceed 13.9 billion, up 4 billion under the SNP. And patient satisfaction is at 86% of those approval of inpatients who rate their experience positively. Now, positivity in debates like this is not something I normally relate to the opposition. But let's continue down that positive uh, uh, kind of road. The success of this is all down, as everyone said, is down to those that work within the health service. And that's the most important part. But they also the most important people in this debate are the patients themselves. Now, as a constituency MSP in Paisley, when I do get cases like this, my first thought is never, hold on there, I'm going to write a strongly worded motion, take it to the chamber, and I'm going to showboat in front of the cameras. Yeah, my yeah. first choice yeah, yeah. is to say, I will deal with this issue and get in touch with the health board yeah, yeah, and represent yeah. the people of Paisley as I should. Yeah. 
So I think when you look at this, you have to bring them back into the real world and away from the showbiz of the Lib Dems. And if we look at this, if we look at the treatment time guarantee, the poorest quarter we've had was quarter four last year, which 72.7%. And the Cabinet Secretary has apologised for this and he's assured that there is a robust plan to avoid this in the future. That, presiding officer, is what government is all about. Yeah, yeah. Seeing the issue and making sure that you put a plan in place to do something about it. But the waiting time improvement plan uh, that was, uh, came out on 23rd of October 2018, it's ensuring that we will continue to have improved access to high quality care. The immediate focus in the improvement plan is to reduce waiting time for patients whose treatment is urgent and the initial funding of the health boards will be to improve performance with recruitment and additional nursing staff, new equipment and staff over the very important weekend and also offering uh, time over the weekends and evening clinics to ensure that there is actually time for people to get involved. But one of the important things about this is the improvement plan includes £535 million in frontline spending and around £120 million spent in capital. So, presiding officer, as we look at this debate, the idea is for us to be positive about our NHS, positive about the work's going. But first and foremost, if anyone's going to come into this chamber, show me your ideas and tell me what you would do differently. Thank you. Closing speeches. I call David Stewart. Closed for Labour. Four minutes, Mr Stewart. Thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. And can I say this has been an excellent debate on a vital issue, and I want to thank members from across the chamber for their insightful and knowledgeable and strongly felt contributions. I was particularly shocked from the contribution from George Adam, who said that he never showboats in the chamber. Well, that's news for me. That's news for me, presiding officer. Um, but I would like to thank the Liberal Democrats for using their initiative in securing this afternoon's uh, debate. Now, we all know that waiting times are difficult when a patient is suffering from an illness or an injury. Any time between cause or diagnosis and treatment is unwanted. It, of course, prolongs the pain as well as uh, adding additional stress to mental and physical well-being. Now, members this afternoon, like Alice Cole, uh, Alex Cole Hamilton, Monica Lennon, James Kelly, Alison Johnston, and Miles Briggs have illustrated this perfectly by quoting dissatisfied constituents who felt down, let down by the system. A system that we have heard was put in place by the Patients' Rights Scotland Act 2011, in place to guarantee a 12-week treatment time. This, of course, allowed hospitals and boards to manage expectations and for patients to have a known time frame. But what we can't forget, presiding officer, is that waiting times aren't just simple facts and figures. Behind every delay in getting an operation or seeing a consultant, there's a person, often with anxieties and pain and stress. Let me also give you an example. I remember many years ago when an 80-year-old Inverness writer, who's the late Bette McArdle, came to see me, because she was told she had to wait 11 months for a relatively simple cataract operation. And she said, and I quote, it's vital that we oxygentarians are able to lead independent lives and still contribute to society. And it has to be remembered that many of us are still caring for a partner or family member. Without the basic support of maintaining adequate eyesight, we can rapidly become even more dependent on NHS and care service uh, that costs the state. Every statistic holds similar stories. And in this, this individual case, while well, of course I can't fault NHS Highland in trying to clear the backlog and reduce the waiting time, it's concerning these procedures are often having to be outsourced to private companies and other boards at great, great cost. Now, if we look back to Audit Scotland's report in 2018, there was a number of worrying statistics that not one board were meeting all the key national performance targets. Only three more boards met the 62-day target for cancel referrals, and the number of people on waiting lists continued to increase and more people waited longer for outpatient and inpatient appointments. Now, one of the key problems identified in the Audit Scotland report is the widespread difficulty meeting demand and the impact this having on waiting times. Now, many members have said, Brian Officer, and I'd like to uh, echo this, that frontline NHS staff work tirelessly to try and ensure that staffing issues, lack of resources, and underfunding don't compromise patient care, but they do in the face of growing pressure. It's important to acknowledge that the hard work being put through under tough circumstances by NHS staff across the board, but that shouldn't stop us 
uh, expressing uh, concerns. I'd also like to flag up the whole issues that I've done many times before in this chamber, about the whole issue of life expectancy and the difference between those from deprived areas and more uh, affluent areas. But in conclusion, President Officer, I'm very conscious of time. As we know, the NHS turned 70 last year, and we're still having to fight to protect it. And one of my heroes, Nye Bevan, said, and I quote from him again, that discontent arises from knowledge of the possible as contrasted with the actual. These debates are frustrating because we can do so much better. The debate has shone a bright light into the dark areas of the NHS. We have a legally binding 12-week treatment time guarantee. Let's try and achieve it. Thank you very much. I call on Brian Whittle to close the Conservatives. Four minutes, please. Hey, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I thank the Liberal Democrats for bringing forward this debate to the Chamber today. Now, I'm a big believer in setting goals and targets. I think before you begin any journey, I think it's really helpful to know where you're trying to get to. However, the problem here for the Scottish Government is the 12-week target is not an aspiration. It's a legally binding guarantee that's been broken over 190,000 times. And as Alex Cole Hamilton has said, apparently with no repercussions to the Scottish Government. One wonders, Deputy Presiding Officer, what the definition is of legally binding legislation in the eyes of the government. Now the government have suggested that they will reach this, this legally binding guarantee in 2021, a full decade after the Patients' Rights Act was passed. Frankly, I have to say a reasonable goal for the Scottish government would be to try and get the numbers of times the target is missed back to the level it was when they first introduced it. Because the numbers have continued to deteriorate, I've got to tell George Adam sharply, since then, the Scottish Government can't lay the blame on anybody else's door but their own, much as they may try. I don't think they'll hit the target in 2021. I think everyone in this chamber knows that. I think this is just a way of trying to kick the can down the road a bit further until they can come up with another line. The reason they have not and will not hit their target is quite simple, Deputy Presiding Officer. When one sets a goal, you need to plan the steps that will help to achieve that goal. The Cabinet Secretary said that herself in her address. Simply setting a goal will not make it happen. You might get a nice headline at the time, but the goal will not be achieved. Who was in the Scottish Government was thinking about the implications on the front line of imposing such a goal? Who in the Scottish Government was looking at the actions the Government would have to take to enable the NHS staff to achieve these goals? I think the answer is quite patently no one. The Scottish Government set a goal without understanding the implications. It imposed it on its health service and told them just to get on with it. The goal itself has been instrumental, I think, in creating an environment where it's impossible to meet the goal. By holding the NHS to these goals without giving them the tools, the technology and the resource to help achieve them, I think the Scottish Government risks driving behaviour that is not necessarily in the best interests of patient care or, in fact, healthcare professionals. The truth is, increasingly, increasingly missed hit 12-week waiting time guarantee is the accumulation of many areas of policy failure. As my colleague Miles Biggs highlighted, the 18-week mental health referrals is constantly breached. The 62-day cancer urgent referral standards is missed. The lack of competent workforce planning, as Monica Lennon highlighted, and so on and so on, all contribute to the SNP government breaking its own legal commitment more and more each year. Finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, what gets me is that there's this indignation of the Scottish Government when we have the audacity to point out to them they have failed to meet their own objectives. I think that, to me, tells me everything we need to know about the government. They will accept the plaudits for setting the targets and legal policy, but refuse to take the responsibility and the appropriate action when they are missed. 12 years, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, 12 years. It's about time the SNP government finally looked at themselves in the mirror. Deputy President. Thank you very much. And I call Claire Hawkey to close the government. Minister, five minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. As with healthcare systems across the world, our NHS in Scotland is facing increasing demand and challenges that requires a long-term sustainable solution. This is a very complex landscape which calls for open, transparent and constructive debate, which in some members' contributions today has been very positive, however, in some has been extremely lacking. Um, we regret not being able to discuss further in the debate Alison Johnson's call for a national conversation, and we would certainly welcome further discussion on this issue. And we also welcome her highlighting the impact of Brexit on our NHS. Um, I certainly don't uh, recognise some of the figures that Brian Whittle quoted um, or some of the statements that he made, and I'm sorry I'm not important enough to intervene on Edward Mountain. 
Um, we are very much a person-centred NHS and are committed to delivering high-quality healthcare to everyone, every time. And the commitments we've made as a government will support the delivery of this ambition. But we shouldn't forget that our NHS does deliver a first-class service. And while there are areas that do need to improve, like waiting times, I would like to echo the Cabinet Secretary's comments earlier and acknowledge the admirable work done on a daily basis by our healthcare staff. Over and above the waiting times plan, we have also published three new delivery plans at the end of last year, which form the blueprint for the next phase of the mental health strategy. I don't have time. The delivery of our programme for government mental health commitments will see a total additional investment of over £250 million over the next five years. And this government continues to provide support to boards. I've got too much to say, I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I can't take another breath. Improving their performance against waiting time standards by investing £54 million to improve recruitment, retention and services. And under this government since 2007, the psychology services workforce has increased by 67%. On CAMS, we acted quickly in response to the initial recommendation of the Children and Young People's Task Force by committing an additional £4 million to help increase capacity within that workforce of around 80 additional CAMS staff. And as our understanding of mental health is deepening, our understanding of what we should do in support is changing as well. The answer lies in whole systems approaches, which draws in support from across the public sector. Mental health is no longer a health only issue is an issue that cuts right across our public services. We need to make sure that everyone around those facing mental health challenges knows how to listen with a sympathetic ear. It's about trusting relationships and creating the environment for honest and supportive conversations about mental health. This is a stigma issue. Reducing and eliminating stigma should be at the core of what we do. Doing so is necessary if we're going to achieve what we want to achieve. And additionally to, improve, uh, additionally, to ensure patients are treated in the most appropriate environment for them, we are also using technology to improve, support improvement in primary to secondary clinical care advice provision. Early uh, indications from initial pilots are that this is having a positive impact, and this will ultimately support the reduction of waiting times. The annual operating plans introduced last year have been developed to manage performance across the whole system, including financial and quality and safety performance. And these plans represent an agreement that sets out how NHS boards will deliver the expected levels of performance to provide the foundations of, for delivering the Scottish Government's priorities on waiting times improvements, investment in mental health and greater progress and pace in the integration of health and social care. And we'll use these plans to monitor performance regularly to ensure the NHS boards remain on track to deliver the agreed commitments and milestones. These plans, once agreed, will be published on individual boards' websites over the summer. Presiding officer, we will continue to work closely with our healthcare partners across Scotland to improve performance and to deliver our ambition of sustainable waiting times. Thank you very much. Now I call on Alec Cole-Hammond to close the Liberal Democrats. Then I'm moving straight on to the next debate, so we don't waste time in your next debate. Mr Cole-Hammond. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm grateful to everyone who contributed today's debate. I'm sure I'm not the only member in this chamber who uh, noticed the Cabinet Secretary and the Minister both visibly crumple when George Adam got to his feet. So adrift from their measured tone was his address. It's uh, striking that the speech of a government chief whip should be such an attack piece. It demonstrates just how exposed this particular flank is to the government. <laughs> Nevertheless, I do thank the, the cabinet secretary and the minister for their measured tone and the way in which they've addressed this and, and taken it head on. I particularly welcome the unreserved apology that the government offers both in the remarks of the Cabinet Secretary and their amendment today to the patients, the th tens, hundreds of thousands of patients affected by the breached treatment time guarantee. I also welcome the direction offered in her remarks around the fact that boards should be directed uh, to be straight with people from the outset about being realistic in terms of the assessment of the time they should be expected to wait. It isn't what happens now. We need to get this right. People are being um, hinted at the, the reality that that 12-week time may be missed, but when they get to line two and say, you have a guarantee that you will be seen within 12 weeks, people stop reading. 
People don't put that down. They, they don't necessarily notice the corollary that says, but in many cases, we may not be able to see you uh, within that time. Can I just also echo her thanks for our hardworking NHS staff? It's always easy to look at opposition amendments which criticise any aspect of the health force, uh, uh, health service, and, and believe that that's some kind of inferred attack on our staff. It is not. It is not their fault that we are creating false hope in our patients about how long they could expect to wait. And anything uh, to suggest otherwise diminishes the argument against. She also expressed disappointment that, that we are not coming forward with solutions. Um, at the very heart of this lies the delays around which this centres. And I, I, she asked her for a solution, so I'll give you one. We need to take the bureaucratic systems of the NHS out of the dark ages. I had a, a, a patient came in to see me in my surgery who had been referred for suspected oral cancer to the dental hospital. She gave me the letter of referral, which said, had the astonishing admission at the top of the page, which said it had been dictated in October 2017 and finally typed in December 2017, missing a full two months of delay for potentially life-threatening treatment that she could have received earlier. So take our admin out of the 1970s. Don't leave letters lying around in dictaphones. I'm grateful also for uh, Miles Briggs tying this debate to the Mental Health uh, Week. He knows my party's position on this. If your child fell off her bike and broke her arm, she would be in plaster by the end of the day. But if she came to you with anxiety or depression, she could join one of the longest waits in the entire of our NHS. In some cases, two years for first-line child and adolescent mental health services. We need to keep saying it because it is still a national outrage. Monica Lennon is absolutely right. This guarantee is not worth the paper it is uh, written on. And she did a good job of making, uh, or Claire Hohe actually in her intervention did a good job of making that point for her. It was, I think, very important uh, that to look at the link between uh, th that, those weights and poverty, because in a lot of cases, people are incapacitated by the reason they need surgery. They suddenly have to wait a year. That may be a year out of employment and potentially out of sick pay as well. Um, I think I also just wanted to thank her for, for her remarks, personal remarks about her mother's experience, and we wish her mother well and a very happy birthday when that comes. Alison Johnson, uh, Alison and I usually see eye to eye on health debates. We don't today, and that, uh, I'm disappointed by that. Um, she has a problem with the suggestion that we need government to write to patients individually, apologising and explaining the delays to their treatment time guarantee. At, the, at this point in time, no accountability exists for this repeatedly missed legally binding treatment time guarantee, and fundamentally we need to address that. I'm afraid I don't have time. Uh, Mike Rumbles was uh, characteristically uh, positive in terms of his uh, work for his constituents in speaking up for the North East. He repeatedly raises the issue of the NRAC reduction to Grampian and the impact that that has had on waiting times in that health board. But each of our health boards have similar tales to tell in terms of the problems particular to our regions uh, that we experience. Now, Emma Harper tried to suggest that I was somehow suggesting that contracting in private health care was in part of the solution. That, that's not what I was saying at all. I was saying that giving people the facts and allowing them to make different choices if they have the means to do so would actually help to stem the problem. It would relieve pressure on the NHS. My father needed a knee replacement surgery. He was told he was going to have to wait 40 weeks. He said he was in a lot of discomfort and said, well, I'm going to do that. And I said, but dad, you can afford to go private if you wanted to. He said, oh no, but I want to support the NHS, he said. I said, dad, you're supporting the NHS by getting off the waiting list and allowing somebody into the system because you can afford to take that choice. It's about giving people the facts and allowing them to make different choices. Edward Mountain is right, and, and it, sorry isn't enough, an apology isn't enough. We need to change behaviours. That starts by removing suggestions that someone will be seen within 12 weeks. We need to reform that inadequate correspondence. He's also correct to put point, about, uh, point to the psychological pressure that this puts on staff. Finally, I just want to address George Adams' uh, attack speech. I, I found that very disappointing. There are some very serious issues here which affect constituents in every single constituency represented by this parliament. He diminished his, his argument by so doing. This parliament's job is to hold government's feet to the fire. If we do not do that, if we are prevented from doing that, what is the point in having a parliament? Presiding officer, there are hundreds of thousands of patients who are looking to this chamber for to be straight with them, to have their health boards be straight with them about the time that they expect to wait, and we should answer that call.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes that debate, and I have a very brief pause while I let the front bench take their positions for the next debate.